the world may rage outside, but the writer sits alone in a room, in darkness and solitude, lost in thought, lost in words and books, emerging into the sunlight only when the masterpiece has been completed. This, at least, is the romantic notion we have of writers and writing. The truth, of course, is less romantic. Writers are of the same world as the rest of us, and a large part of their work, like ours, consists in making sense of the world, in understanding it and their place in it, in finding a home in the world. In February 2002, over 50 celebrated Indian writers got together in Nimrana, a medieval fort 80 kilometers from Delhi, for the first ever international festival of Indian literature. The festival was called At Home in the World. We imagine that writing flows easy from the pen of genius, but this is not the case. Even before pen is put on paper, in that gap between thought and print, in that space between home and world, the writer must face many difficult and unromantic questions. What language should I write in? What audience should I write for? What world should I write about? What people should I represent and how should I represent them? These questions are especially relevant for an Indian writer who writes, after all, in a literature of many languages and who writes as Indian from many parts of the world. Quite apart from our romantic ideas, there is a whole world and business of writing that writers have to consider before they even begin to write. To be a writer, as I've said before, it isn't necessary only to deal in the spirit. In our modern world, books are physical objects. They're industrial objects. They need a great apparatus around them. They need an apparatus of uh, readers, critics, well-trained critics. They need newspapers to publicize them. They need bookshops. They need all these things which to some extent, or to a large extent, didn't exist for me at the beginning. A good publisher can make even an ordinary work, a classic, by paying a huge amount of money and making news of it. A reputation of a book is made not by a literary critic, but by the publisher. Not an Indian publisher, but a British publisher or an American publisher. They make reputations. As for myself, can you really imagine that I could, a priori, I have thought that a book of 50, 100 pages set in an obscure time, in an obscure corner of India, without a glossary and without any explicit sex, <laughs> could have been considered a publishable, let alone sort of uh, a saleable version, uh, that I could have imagined in my remotest dream that this book would have found a publisher. And people do not write for the purpose of making money. I least certainly I don't write for the purpose of making money. Um, after having written you know, A Suitable Boy, the obvious thing would be to write first an unsuitable boy, <laughs> then a suitable girl, and then an unsuitable girl. I mean, I would have made it. I had a ready-made market, and there it was. I keep getting asked a question by interviewers. Do you th every, f every five years, do you think Indian writing has come of age now? So uh, I, said, uh, I, I find this odd. Indian writing has come of age. When did it first come of age? Well, Salman Rushdie was the first time, then this, then that, then Arundhati Rai won the Booker Prize. So this is like watching an aging person uh, again and again celebrating his 21st birthday. <laughs> we live completely in the present, and there is this, this, this amnesia about literary history. Um, and because there is this amnesia about literary history and continuums and, and things being, books being related to each other in, in this way, uh, we have this kind of manic state of affairs in, book, in which books and people are con constantly in competition with each other and not related to each other in, in a kind of space. Writing comes with its pressures in the modern world and the same pressures exist on the festival. After all, there are only 50 or so writers here. Countless others weren't invited. Perhaps because they weren't considered worthy enough. The festival is like the medieval fort it is taking place in, giving haven to those it calls its own, but also keeping others out. 
This is of course inevitable. Lines have to be drawn somewhere. Boundaries have to be staked. Yet these lines and boundaries are always contested. The fort is always under siege. Can one be sure, for instance, where one house of literature ends and another begins? Is Rushdie an Indian writer? Is Naipaul an English one? Or do we simply use words like multicultural and global and hope that we have described adequately the current state of literature? Indians are, are born multiculturalists. Uh, I think much of the world is envious of the Indian population, at least the urban population, because most Indians that I know who grow up in cities grow up speaking three or four languages, have access to a myriad religions. Um, if, whether they choose to be or not, by the time they're 20 years old, have all these different cultures singing and clashing and conspiring uh, within them. And I think in some ways, more and more of the world is trying and aspiring and beginning to be India. Along with terrific, uh, wonderful qualities that multiculturalism has brought us, uh, it has also created a certain kind of dumbing down, which I think is based on no one culture having any standards. All the standards have been diluted, no one can know anymore what's a formal prose, what's good writing, what is bad writing. We are all really sailing in, un in, uh, in uncharted seas and we have no idea what our compass is or where we are headed. We just have this babble of voices and babble of cultures. The only one I think theme that is missing very much in Indian writing is humor. You really have to tickle your armpits to get a laugh to this, these things. Uh, there is, what we have now is ethnic humor. It's being always our tradition. Uh, Ayers versus Ayingers, they have proverbs and things. Marwari is a common subject of uh, humor. Uh, Bawajis. Parsis, uh, or to avoid it, aren't you? Or most of all, Sardarji, uh, which I'm partly guilty of. The idea of romantic love was absent in Indian literature because it's carnal love. You read Kalidasa and other, in, in Jayadeva, it's, it's all very erotic, very fine, but uh, Love without body was absent in Indian literature. Indian literature today has got a very great opportunity. That in the emptiness uh, and void of most European literature as, there is, as it is today, um, not only can Indian literature bring news from the village, um, which is obviously its main attraction at the moment, that it, it is fascinating to discover worlds we don't know from countries that we don't know, in languages that we don't know, um, but all reported to us finally through translation in English. Um, a certain universality is available to us and available to Indian writers. Now, if universal, by universal we mean European literature, if Martin Amos is universal, then I would say God bless us all, <laughs> because it isn't. Halfway through the festival, camouflaged under much gaiety and politeness, opposing camps are flourishing. The biggest ground of division? Language. On the one hand, Indian writers in English, with the vanity of an international audience. On the other hand, regional writers, on whom we would like to fix the label of neglected genius. True to the form of political correctness, our Honourable Prime Minister stands up for the cause of our regional writers. As I said before, we are proud of the success of Indians writing in English, which has made some of our writers at home in the world. 
However, I am filled with despair when I think of the problems of literary writing in other languages in India. Those who write in languages other than English often suffer from very undeserved neglect. Uh, the Prime Minister spoke very, very movingly about uh, Indian writing in, in, uh, in Indian languages and the difficulty and unfairness for those writers. But in a way, we can't do much about that. Writing depends on readership. And if in those languages, shall we say, Marathi or whatever, there was a sufficiently large readership, the books, if they were great enough, would have made an impression. Why is it that you do not write in Bengali? Your mother tongue asked a challenging voice. The young man who spoke it appeared to be quite angry. Amit had asked this question and had asked himself this question many times before. His answer was that his Bengali was not good enough for him to be able to express himself in the manner that he could in English. It wasn't a question of choice. Someone who had been trained all his life to play the sitar could not become a sarangi player because his ideology or his conscience told him to. You want yes, a human potato. <laughs> An Indian vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> the tomato, the chili, right? Uh, as far as I know, all of these things have been here for roughly the same time as the English language has been here, right? <laughs> Three or four hundred years. But if you went down to the kitchens, uh, or if you went across, I don't know why you should go down to the kitchen, if you went across to the kitchens and talked to somebody there, there would be a pretty unanimous response. Uh, you know, this is India. So then why should there be this niggling doubt about the language and therefore about me uh, when it comes to English? Yeah, yeah. In India, we had to deal with at least three languages always. Um, I once quote, you know, I think first day I quoted Ramanujan's poem where he said, I spoke to my mother in the kitchen in Tamil, um, in Canada in the streets, English upstairs. <laughs> 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 A hundred years ago, he would have spoken perhaps Sanskrit of states. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but Canada in the states and some other language, which is Manama. So we have to live with three languages. And then you may choose any one of these three to write about. That's why you know, I'm not saying that one should write in English or this or that. But I always believe that writing in the language of the street has an advantage over the language upstairs as well as the language in the kitchen. Yes. <laughs> The importance of a language is related to its political, economic and cultural and commercial power and position in the international community. And English has the edge here, there's no question about it, in job opportunities and advancement of all kinds. And this is not fair. But what is fair in this world? Nothing is fair, don't expect it to be. And don't whine about it. Get in there, strive, make yourself heard, and Indian languages will prevail when India prevails in the world community. I feel that if you are really great, no ambush can ever affect you anyway. Thank you. English language, well and good. It's a useful tool. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. I always tell my students, why Angreji Basha Shikho? As, as Dhanangan Bhagat, uh, one, another very fine Gujarati poet, he said, Gujarati Madhyam, uh, Gujarati Madhyam, or Angreji Uttam. <laughs> there are, uh, in the 60s, my own sensibility was not uh, formulated by T.S. Eliot translated, but more by Rilke and uh, Baudelaire and Malarme. So English language is okay, no problem with it. But if I want to go in, and I have in a large way, I know, I taught myself French, translated UNESCO. I am an Indian, and I refuse to be dominated by any one language, including my mother tongue. Domination by language, in the Indian case, is also domination by history. English, after all, was a gift of British rule. But history also dominates over literature in another sense, that of responsibility to a literary tradition. When a country has forms that are as old as ours, 
then which history you find home in, which history you want to defend, turns out to be quite a contested matter. Indian literature is terribly young and new, I mean fiction, because it goes back to forms which are totally Western. So the late forms of the novel, which were grafted onto in Indian material. And that is a point that I didn't, which was never mentioned in a way, as if in the literature of today, existed in a sort of vacuum. But no. And you have, in a way, I think Indian literature should go much, should go back to its own past much more. In these days, I've never heard once mentioned what is a treasure of the ancient in the literature, after all. Uh, one of the extraordinary experiences of this conference has been that I have heard Mr. Kalasso over the last three days berating us for a, a Indian writers for a variety of sins <laughs> and he's been advising us on what we should do. Now, it strikes me, apart from the astonishing impertinence of this drivel, you know, it strikes me as amazing that he cannot see that it's precisely these aspects of Indian conflict which are exactly the subject of what we have to say. It is precisely these matters of, say, both shame and pride and the division between the two which form the subject of what we write about. That if he thinks that, you know, uh, we should just uh, reproduce, you know, uh, uh, the Rig Veda as he might want to reproduce the Iliad or whatever, then he's really asking us to write Italian literature. And this is of no interest to us. I mean, Italian literature is bad enough anyway. Why should we want to do it? No one has any interest in Italian literature. They have not had for the last 50 years. Who is he to tell us what we should talk about? We talk about what interests us. You know, I mean, if we, if he thinks he knows, uh, you know, that writers in Europe uh, do this and we should do the same thing. This is just absolute nonsense. And I don't know how, uh, how or for what reason we put up with it. Really, I, I mean, it's completely astonishing to me. Well, to say the least, I was astonished by the amount of misunderstandings that I perceived in the words of Amitabh Kosh. I had not only a sort of sequence of personal insults, but to my astonishment, to the poor Italian literature who was totally innocent, <laughs> and, and I, 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 I was stupefied by that. Moreover, moreover, I heard in his words a sort of undertone, meaning that it was not only my humble self who was producing people, but mythology itself and the fact of being having to do with mythology, as if, and this is a very common view, which is still held by lots of people and totally school, as if mythological stories were a sort of fables or a sort of superstitious and uh, uh, obscure past uh, that, uh, that we are adults now, that stories for children, we are adults, and we have to do with something called reality. Reality, you know, as if we knew what this word means. What was implied in uh, the words of Gosh was exactly what I feared as I was raising those questions. The total lack of perception that you are missing something huge in the past. If somebody asks me, what has been the greatest curse of the 200 years of colonialism? I would say about economic deprivation, frustration, etc. I mean, they are well known. The most, the most tragic aspect of this last 200 years of colonialism, 
we have become homeless in our own home. We, have, we, we, talk, we talk about home and homelessness. We Indians have become, have been deprived of our own home that we are living. We have become refugees in our own uh, habitat. There is an anarchy of voices here. So many different languages to write in, such varying conceptions of audience, so many homes and worlds, each defined contingently with vague boundaries and gaping holes. How does the fort even stand? Is there any sense in which we can even speak of one Indian literature? We put this question to several Indian writers. In imaginative terms, I think each one needs a separate imagination. Canada has a separate imagination. Malayalam has a different imagination. Tamil has. But I think when you're talking, are you introducing nationalism into this? I don't know. <laughs> if, you are, if you're doing that, then it's a different matter. Otherwise, I think in very broad, innocent political terms, Indian literature means uh, all these people who are writing in, uh, in Indian languages, which includes 100% positively English also. So uh, that is, uh, I think that's the only way you can look at it. On a larger basis, you know, if you want to make a big abstraction, yes, there is one literature. You could also say that there is one European literature written in several European languages. There is one Indian literature written in several Indian languages. And what binds them together? Was a friend of mine said there are two languages of India which are understood all over India. And these two languages of India are Ramayana and Mahabharata. This may not be true of uh, Western epics, but it is certainly true of Indian epics because they are no longer the possession of only the educated class. They are more the possession of the classes which are not educated. Yesterday, uh, somebody else, you know, I told this story of <coughs> Sita. There are a thousand Ramayanas in Canada, and among the thousand Ramayanas, one Ramayana, which is a world of Ramayana, Sita tells Rama, I, will, I should also go to the forest with you. And he says, no, you are a princess and you are tender feet, you can't. And he goes on again, and at the end, this illiterate Sita tells him, in every Ramayana, Sita goes to the forest. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> this is a great example of intertextuality. You know, there is so much of intertextuality. You know, one language entering into, into another. Now, in, the, in certain Catholic pockets of Goa, the Northeast, and in the mangrove Catholic world that I write about, uh, Bugs Bunny and uh, perhaps uh, Robin Hood were more languages that we spoke than, than the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And that had only to do with historical reasons. It had nothing to do with that I wouldn't have wanted it otherwise, but it was a hermetically sealed word, and I don't think I think to, to succumb to that idea would be to kind of succumb to the BJP kind of line. So I just want to correct that. I think some friends here today were talking about tradition. I think that's the most dangerous thing to talk about in these days. I, I, I don't know here about And uh, this kind of identity setting in terms of tradition and all, whether it is Arabic or whosoever, I think it is, it is uh, it's very poisonous. Because the, the important thing, I mean, I think you were saying that uh, uh, that the two classical uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata has been retold in all the Malaya, in, in all the Indian languages, and that set the you know the start for the uh, for the growth of the thing, which is true. But then every language has a classical tradition, and that may be uh, something like uh, Homer's work for I mean, you, it is a given. You can't you can't make too much out of that. You have uh, your Ramayana, you have your Mahabharata, or you may have your Bible, or whatever, whatever. But then, the, the, the telling point is when you learn to cut away from that and stand on your own and incorporate uh, the life of today. How can you have criticism if you're not even sure you'll be allowed to write about something and you don't even know where you might go wrong? I think that is one point. And the second thing is, are you only allowed to write about what you were born into? Um, so does that mean you can only be sharp about um, uh, certain things which are seen as Hindu territory, if you're Hindu? I mean, we know that Kushwan Singh got into trouble uh, in Bengal because he said certain things about Rabindranath. I mean, so if, if uh, the ability to be hurt is, you know, is, is, is always uh, in the foreground, 
I don't think we can talk about uh, uh, freedom to map all kinds of spaces. I don't think we can talk about uh, criticism. I think we can only talk about maintaining tradition, a dead one. What is the relation between word and song? It's not different from the relation between home and world. Just as home is an order found in the chaos of the world, the song is an order found in the anarchy of words. To sing is to capture speech, to measure it, to scale it. But this domination is far from malicious. The song takes the word by the hand and makes it fly. Yes, there is an anarchy of voices here, but there is also a hidden song. It is to that song that we could give the name Indian literature. One might have to listen hard to hear its unifying strains, but they are there, echoing in the vast creative spaces that lie between the home and the world. All you who sleep tonight, all you who sleep tonight, far from the ones you love, no hand to left or right, and emptiness above, know that you aren't alone. The whole world shares your tears, some for two nights or one, and some for all their years.